What's going on everybody? Welcome back for a part two of three uh, video kind of, I guess it's a video series, I guess you could say. It's not really a series, uh, but it's a part two continuation of a video I posted last week in regards to a subscriber commented saying, hey, it would be awesome if you would run through some of your really, you know, favorite materials. So uh, first video, I went through a whole bunch of uh, all my bins because I have all my bins kind of categorized by type. I went through a bunch already, uh, so now round two is going through more bins. And probably round three will hopefully be the last of it. <laughs> so I'm sure this video is gonna be a little bit long, just like the first one was, about an hour long. Hopefully, maybe not, we'll see. Um, so, favorite, or my favorite materials. Uh, the next category I wanted to tackle was the herbal category. And herbal could mean uh, a lot of things to a lot of people, but the way I classify my herbals is a little bit differently. Like, I, I keep my lavenders in my herbal bin, even though I don't technically think lavender is an herb per se. It's more of an aromatic, uh, but it could be a, an herb. Uh, like, I keep my juniper berry, my pettigrains, all my herbs like, uh, you know, sage, thyme, marjoram. Uh, my mints, my corianders, my basils, all those kind of herbs. So I'm gonna go through and just talk about some of my favorite ones that I really, really enjoy going for. And some of the ones that I kind of are like, eh, I probably shouldn't have bought it because it just sits there and collects dust. So of my herbal categories, um, most of my herbs are naturals. I don't have too many synthetics. I think the only two synthetics that I have uh, maybe three, actually four. Okay, so I have uh, four or five synthetics, but I don't reach for my synthetics when it comes to herbal uh, things in my fragrances. Now, me personally, I'm not a fan of herbal fragrances per se. Um, I, I do enjoy putting just a little, you know, a little sprig, a little, little toss in like a little pinch of salt of herbalness in fragrances to maybe liven it up, but never so much where it just turns into an herbal smelling fragrance because nobody wants to walk around just smelling like you know a cooking kitchen or like an herb shop or something like that so um some of the synthetic ones i'll talk about first uh the one that i love going for a lot of the times anytime i want to do some sort of mint um i grab a, a material called fresco mint and i think it's made by iff it's either IFF or Givaudan, one of those two. And Fresco Mint is a synthetic material that mimics the smell of uh, spearmint. So it's very smooth. It's not sharp and peppery like peppermint could be. Uh, it's not as menthol smelling like wintergreen. Spearmint is more almost reminds me of like a, a toothpaste or a bubble gum like spearmint uh, chewing gum it's very light aromatic crisp clean cooling but never never too bitey it's it's crisp and clean without being overly snappy and uh, yeah fresco mint is one I reach for actually quite a bit because some of my other naturals um, could impart some a little bit of off notes um, well, since we're talking about mint, we'll, we'll just keep going with the mint category. Now, some of the naturals that I do enjoy uh, reaching for, I've got two other ones here. Uh, we'll do this one. Now, I've got your standard uh, just spearmint essential oil. And I forget what region. I think this one's from Oregon. Um, I, I purchased it from libertynaturals.com. And I usually like to combo, uh, do a combination of this spearmint essential oil with fresco mint because uh, usually mint essential, uh, essential oils don't last really as long. They're considered very fleeting top notes. You'll, you'll probably get it you know, within the first 15, 20 minutes of the, the initial spray and then the mint starts fading really fast. But that's where the fresco mint comes in. It kind of uh, helps drag it down more into the into the mid notes, not necessarily, it's not as long lasting to call it a mid note, but it helps drag uh, the naturals down a little further. So uh, the one that I usually go for first with any, anytime I'm doing like some sort of minty cooling note in any fragrance, I usually go for spearmint first, uh, cause spearmint is the less or the least camphorous or the least medicinal smelling of all the mints. 
Uh, so Spearmint uh, from Oregon is one of my favorites. Uh, I do have uh, Peppermint also from Oregon as well. But with peppermint, because for me, peppermint is very medicinal smelling. It's very snappy. It's very cutthroat punching in your face with just so much snap and it's just, it's cold smelling. Um, so I, the one that I purchased again, I think this was also from Liberty Naturals. Uh, this is a three times distilled. So it's distilled three times to purify and clean it up a little bit. So this is probably the cleanest peppermint that I've ever purchased and smelling it literally smells like a Christmas time candy cane. Like if you take a candy cane and you just take that plastic wrapper off, you stick it in your mouth and immediately it tingles your nose and it's just cooling and just very snappy and minty and, and almost peppery because it's so snappy. That's what the, the three times distilled peppermint uh, from Oregon is to me. And it's really, really great, but it's really, really strong. I don't use peppermint uh, as far as an amount uh, as much as I would spearmint because spearmint is so easy to work with um, and then another mint uh, that I usually grab a lot uh, is just your standalone it's a synthetic you know just a well it's not synthetic it's a natural occurring molecule called uh, carvone L or L carvone um, and that's the cooling sensation that you get from spearmint because different mints will give you different uh, cooling sensations. So you've got your carvones, uh, your menthols, and you know all these other different kinds of mints. Because different mint plants, whether if it's wintergreen, peppermint, spearmint, all have a different type of cooling uh, sensation. And carvone L is the minty cooling sensation you get from spearmint. So sometimes if I need the cleanest smelling spearmint possible, I'll just use carvone L. The uh, the individual molecule and use that. Okay, so that's it for the mints. I've got some other ones like a, a, a winter green, um, a mint accord that I made just by co you know combination of different mints, but I usually don't reach for them that much. Um, another go-to for mine in the herbal category, um, juniper berry. Now with juniper berry, I love it because it's very light, it's very snappy, and to some people when they smell it, it says it reminds them of gin. Like if you ever had the alcoholic beverage uh, gin, like a gin and tonic, it smells, it smells like gin. I mean, and that's, you know, because juniper berry is used in gin. I mean, there's a lot of things in gin, but juniper berries is one of them. So that's probably why the one reason, you know, people smell it and be like, it smells alcoholic like gin. But to me, it's very snappy, dry, slightly woody, but still kind of gin-like smelling. But uh, the reason why I like this one in particular, it's a CO2 extract. And like, if you watch my other video, like when it comes to naturals, I tend to lean towards CO2 or what they call SFE, you know, super, you know, super critical extracts and stuff like that. I usually lean towards those anytime I'm doing a natural essential oil. The CO2 extract for me is just, it's the cat's meow. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, the cleanest juniper berry that I've ever had. Um, and that's a juniper berry CO2. Uh, I forget where I purchased this. This is either from Furminich or Liberty Naturals, one of the two, not sure. I should have labeled it. Um, now the next one, the next category is going to be lavenders. Uh, I don't know necessarily if lavender is considered an herb, but I keep it in my herbal bin. Uh, now with lavender, lavenders, um, I love lavender because it's so aromatic and so clean and just, it can just take fragrances in different directions, whether if it's a men's fragrance, women's fragrance, but I have favorites and I've got my go-tos. Of all the varieties, now I've got multiple varieties of lavender because different lavenders from different regions of the world or different species of lavenders all smell a little bit different. The one that I usually avoid using is lavendin. Uh, lavendin is not, it's, it's more of a spike lavender. 
Um, it's not as floral. It's more herbaceous and camphorous and medicinal smelling, whereas lavender is the more typical things that people remind of lavender, which is more sweet, floral, you know, um, and just nice smelling in general. So I do have a lavendin here, but I never use it, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, the lavenders that I do love to use, I've got some different varieties and the two that I always reach for the most is a variety called Mallette or I think, I hope I pronounce it correctly. It's a Mallette or Mallettes. Um, but to me, this one is probably the sweetest of the bunch. I would say it's got hardly any off notes, any camphorous notes. There's hardly any medicinal kind of notes to it. It's just your sweet, you know, sweet herbaceous, soft pillowy lavender that you would expect from a lavender. I mean, it's, it's a real clean smelling lavender and I love it. The next one that I really, really have been enjoying lately is uh, this one that I picked up, I believe from libertynaturals.com. And this is from France. It's another lavender. Um, I don't know what variety it is, but it's a it's considered a high elevation lavender, which means it's just grown in a region in a higher elevation. And the higher elevation lavenders just produce a little bit more linalool acetates, which again gives the lavender that sweet smell. And this one's just it's <laughs> it's pretty lovely. It's very sweet. And it's probably cleaner and sweeter than my lavender mallette. So once I started, once I acquired this, this has been my kind of go-to for any of my lavender needs because it's just, it's it's pretty much very soft, very linalool, very linalool acetate, but it still has that nice, comforting, soothing lavender smell. Very clean, very sweet no camphor medicinal notes whatsoever and then of course um, i have lavender absolute uh, and this one's from france and the reason for lavender absolute you're probably like why the hell would you have that lavender essential oils um, tend to be considered more of the top to middle notes uh, if you want to extend them more slightly more into the base, but it's considered more of a middle note is where you would want your Lavender Absolute. Now, the tricky thing is though with Lavender Absolute, because it is a absolute, it's a different kind of smell. Now, this particular one, because it's from France, it's a little bit more cleaned up and refined. Um, I don't detect any real, you know, medicinal camphor notes or anything like that, but it is a darker scent. It's much darker than a, a traditional Lavender Essential Oil where these are more lighter, airier, um, soft and pillowy, your Lavender Absolute is still a lavender and it's still sweet, but it's much more darker. It's much, it's richer, darker, has depth, and it lasts a little bit longer too. So I like to use a little bit of Lavender Absolute, not a lot, usually under one part per thousand, sometimes one part per thousand in a formula if I'm using a lavender essential oil, I'll always put just a touch of lavender absolute with it just to kind of just to give it a little, you know, swift kick in the ass. Uh, let's see, I've got some different coriander seed oils, but I don't use those that much. Carrot seed oil, I don't use that much. I won't talk about that. Oh, let's see. Ah, uh, let's talk about All right, the last one we'll talk about, see, I've got some other ones, like uh, I've got different uh, sages, whether if it's clary sage or regular, you know, sage, uh, Dal I don't wanna say Dalmatian, the regular sage, but I don't use sage that often. I don't use marjoram that often, even though I've got different marjorams. I don't use thyme that often because it's so freaking strong. Uh, but the one thing that I do use quite a bit is uh, pettigrain or pedigran. And again, I know you're probably thinking, well, that's not an herb. No, it's not. It's, it's just to me, pedigrain is kind of green leafy, but so, uh, slightly floral and sweet. So I keep it with my herbals because a lot of herbal materials kind of follow that same characteristic. So pedigrain, 
or pedigran, pedigrain, potato, potato, same thing. Um, there's different ones and there's two that I always lean towards the most often. So you've got regular pedigrain, you know, from Paraguay, the, the region of Paraguay. Uh, that's probably the most common occurring. You can get that one anywhere and it smells good. It's very almost neroli like, you know, people usually use pedigrain to give the sensation of a neroli kind of note. But to me, pedigrain from Paraguay, uh, Paraguay is okay. Because once you start to try different ones is when you're going to be like, aha, now that's what, you know, smells good. So I've got two that I really, really, really love. So you've got your pedigrain. Uh, God, I'm going to butcher the hell out of this. I know I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to say it anyways. It's Pedigrain Bigarad or Bigarde or whatever the hell. You know, I can't pronounce half these things, but God damn it, I'll use them. So the Pedigrain Bigarad or Bigarde or whatever you want to call it is slightly better than just regular Pedigrain oil from Paraguay. Um, it's probably the one that I generally go to if I want just a standard pedigree note, kind of like that typical neroli-ish kind of note that leans more green leafy. But the one that I freaking love is one from, oh, who sells this? I believe it's... I'll have to look it up and put the link in the description below. But this is Pedigran Sur Fleurs. And this is actually distilled, usually Pedigran is distilled from leaves and twigs from the orange tree. Pedigran Sur Fleurs is stems, leaves, and twigs, and some of the flowers uh, distilled along with it. So you're gonna get more of that Neroli aroma and yeah that's that's the stuff i mean that to me is the perfect uh pedigree smell it's god i wish i could remember where i purchased this from think bk think it'll come to me later probably like at the end of the video or something like that uh but if you come across pedigree sewer fluors uh definitely grab it. It's a wonderful scent. Like I said, it's your typical pedigree, green leafy, kind of twiggy, stemmy, definitely orange tree smelling, but because they distill some of the orange blossom flowers along with it, uh, you're going to get some of that more floral neroli like aroma along with it. Now, this is definitely not a neroli essential oil it's more greener than that it's way more greener because this is still a pedigree material just with a couple you know a couple flowers along in the distilled process to give it more of a floral like aroma and it's freaking lovely i love this one so much i want to put it in everything okay um yeah, I think that's it for the herbals. Uh, so let's move on to another category. Uh, yeah, let's just jump into the next category and see what you know. See what we come up with. Okay, so we're on to the next category. But before we go to the next category, I figured out who makes the Pedigree uh, Sewer Fluors, and that is EdenBotanicals.com. Check them out. That's good stuff, and it's reasonably inexpensive too. Okay. So the next category we're going to tackle is what I call the green category. And the green could be so many different things, but I narrow down my greens um, into uh, anything that's grassy, leafy, uh, maybe galbanum, and maybe mossy uh, is my green category. So of all the different greens that I have, the ones that I reach for the most um, definitely 
definitely cis 3 hexanol i mean you gotta have cis 3 hexanol it's in everything it's it's the epitome of the freshly cut grass smell i mean and i know a lot of people are thinking i don't want my fragrances smelling like grass no you probably don't but if you use one part per thousand or even less in a fragrance it's going to freshen it up in a nice green way works wonders in spring fragrances summer fragrances even i mean even winter fragrances too but cis 3 hexanol it's my most reach for green material for sure uh let's see da, 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 da. now if you want to try something a little bit different from cis 3 hexanol um i actually love using Liferome. I think it's made by IFF. Uh, Liferome is still a very green grassy aroma, but it's sweeter. It's almost like if you took a pile of freshly cut grass clippings and you took a like a pear, like a fruit, the pear, and just kind of just went like this and mashed it all up with the, the pulp of the pear fruit and then just smelled your hands and you get this sweet, fruity, grassy aroma. That's what Liferome is. And I love Liferome in combination with cis 3 hexanol because sometimes cis 3 hexanol can come off as too grassy, maybe a little bit too sharp for what you need. Using just a little bit of Liferome with it um, just kind of sweetens it up and kind of the, the combination just pairs really well. Uh, but again, it's really strong, less than one part per thousand usually in a blend. Uh, a full perfume formula is how I, I like to use it. Um, another one that I'm always, always reaching for, probably too much, more than I should, Violet Leaf Absolute. Nobody should be without Violet Leaf Absolute in their uh, stash of goods. Um, it's a perfect green note. It's slightly, I don't want to say violety, but it does have like this fruity banana kind of nuance. Uh, that same kind of fruity banana that you would smell on like a Parma violet. But mostly that fruity banana-ness comes from the actual leaf itself. So violet leaf, absolute. It's, it's great. It's green. It's fruity. It's perfect. Uh, that's another one I'm constantly reaching for. Uh, let's see. Now, a lot of these materials I already have lined out here that I've been using. <laughs> so it's like, it's hard to say, like my bin's kind of empty because some of it's already out here. All this that you see out here is like another fragrance that I'm working on. All this, it's only like maybe 50, 60 materials. So it's a good starting point. But another one, which I think is somewhere buried out there, is um, Cis-3 Hexanol Salicylate. I'm always, always reaching for that. And to me, the cis 3 hexanol salicylate is, while it is a green material, it's very light and kind of effervescent, almost ozonic in a sense, where it's not grassy, it's not leafy, but it's, to me, it's like the heady own of greens, where you can use a good amount of it and it's never gonna really take over the blend too much. Um, I love using cis 3 hexanol salicylate. Like if I have a blend that just feels a little bit too stuffy, too condensed, uh, too cloying, and I need to lighten it up, um, cis 3 hexanol salicylate is one of those things I can use to lighten it up a little bit. Usually like 10 parts per thousand, 15 parts per thousand in a formula will help lighten it up and push things around in a nice green way, in a nice ozonic green way. Uh, let's see, what's another good one to use? Now, one that I probably don't use that often, but I really want to start using it more is Undercavertol, um, which is a synthetic molecule, and it's supposed to mimic the smell of Violet Leaf Absolute, but it really doesn't. It's close, but not really. I would say Yeah, smelling the two side by side, Violet Leaf Absolute for sure is more pungent in green. Uh, Under Cavertol is in the same vein, but it's nowhere near as strong as Violet Leaf Absolute. Um, 
which is why you can probably use, you know, under Cabritol up to maybe almost up to 1% in your perfume formula. And it'll pull off a nice violet leaf, kind of violety green leafy note. Um, yeah, but I usually don't go up to 1% in a formula. Usually I like to stay around three to five, you know, parts per thousand. And that does me just well. Or if I'm using Violet Leaf Absolute, I'll just tuck in a little bit of under Cavertol underneath it as well. Combinations, it's what it's all about. Naturals with synthetics, the combinations are always good. Okay, the last two green uh, materials I wanna talk about, um, your mosses, your oak mosses, your tree mosses, your cedar mosses and all that stuff. So for mosses, the really the only natural that I'll grab is obviously you can use oak moss absolute. So I've got different ones and I think this one I just grabbed is from Siberia. And it's nice. I mean, usually the oak moss absolutes are the best smelling of all the mosses, obviously. Um, but there are IFRA restricted all to the bone and you can barely use them. So what do you do? Well, you use a combination. So if you're ever looking at your formula and you're like, I want to impart some oak moss. Yes, you can still use oak moss absolute, but you're not going to use nearly as much as you want to because of IFRA restrictions. So I'll use a combination. Uh, I'll usually start off with just a smidge of, you know, oak moss absolute, maybe one part per thousand maybe even less than that. I mean, it depends on the fragrance. And then you'll combination uh, with it with something like, you can do, uh, Givaudan makes Oak Moss Jivco, which is their synthetic rendition of Oak Moss. Nowhere near as nice as the real thing, but it gets the job done if you combo the two together. Another one is uh, Evernil, which is a white powder or Vera Moss uh, from IFF. It's the Evernil and Vera Moss are the same thing. Uh, synthetic, it's just a synthetic oak moss. And it's nowhere, again, nowhere near as good as the real deal is the oak moss absolutes. But you gotta do what you gotta do to, you know, get around the IFRA restrictions. So usually, um, I won't use the real Oak Moss Absolute unless the fragrance is actually featuring Oak Moss as a prominent note. Um, like if I'm working on like a, a real hearty, heavy fragrance where I want the Oak Moss to be very apparent and noticeable, yes, then I'll, I'll reach for the Oak Moss Absolute, the real deal, and combo it with like Evernil, Vera Moss, or the Jivco. But if it's just a subtle, just kind of, you know, just a little salt and pepper, in the formula just you know i'll usually just go for the you know evernil powder and just use that um and and just not even use any natural i mean but if it, like i said if it's a featured note and i want it to be apparent then i'll use some of the real deal you want to get some realism in there so that's it for the oh actually one more thing this is probably a big one um, the one that i use um or i keep in the green bin is your galbanum uh, like materials now go it's weird because galbanum is both green and fruity um, typically galbanum is very green leafy but sort of pineapple-y almost in a yeah i mean that's the best way to put it it's a very pineapple-y tart green uh, material and it's nice if you want to impart a green leafiness in your fragrance, but you don't want it overly green. You want to impart some fruity because everybody loves sweet fruity things nowadays. Um, galbanum materials are good for that. And the ones that I like to use, I know I'm using one in this fragrance here that I wanted to talk about. Anyways, there's a uh, cyclogalbanate, which I believe is made from IFF. That's one I reach for a lot. Uh, Dynascone, that's the one. Dynascone is one I'm always reaching for. And then there's another one, I forget who makes this, maybe it's Simrise or Cinerome, uh, but it's Fera, Fera Own or Fera One, Fera None, I forget you know how it's pronounced. Um, but the one that I reach for the most is probably Dynascone but it's super 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 strong like to me it's really strong it can take over a blend like you wouldn't believe i keep my dinoscone diluted 
down to 0.1% when I'm like kind of doing my tinker trials. My cyclogalbinate, which is, to me, it's as good as Dinoscone. Maybe a, like I, I pick up a little bit more fruitiness from cyclogalbinate. So if, if you like Dinoscone, which is more piercing sharp and it's just gonna hammer you in the head with that galbanum, it's probably, to me, this Dinoscone smells more, almost like somebody put in too much amyl, allyl amyl glycolate. It's got that metallic pineapple greenness, which I mean, I personally like, it works wonders, but it's super strong. But if you want something just not so metallic and a little bit more soft and fruity, cyclogalbinate is good. And it's not as strong as Dinoscone, so it's a little bit more forgiving in your dosing. And then the one from, it's either Cinerome or Simrise, I forget which one, the uh, Ferronone or Ferronone, Ferronone, whatever. Um, it's nice, super strong, but it's probably less green of all the bunch and more fruity. And I don't reach for that one this often. I usually just reach for Dinoscone. Dinoscone for me, just it just works in everything. It works for all blends, anything that you need a green galbanum note. Okay, so that's it for the green bin. Let's go check out, uh, let's take a look at another bin. Okay, so this bin is probably my least used bin. And this is my smoky, my leathers, and my incense. Um, for some reason, I don't know why, I, I just don't use a lot of materials in here. And looking at it, it's a nice, you know, it's a good selection of things. You know, all my different saffrons, my different uh, leathers and suede, my frankincense, olibanums, you know, tobaccos. It's, it's just, there's just so many things to talk about in here, but I don't really reach for anything in here, particularly. But, the one that I do probably reach for the most out of here is usually anything frankincense, olibanum related. And let's see, which one do I usually grab the most? I have different olibanums. And I seem to be missing one. It must be out here somewhere. Either that or I miscategorized it. So, frankincense, olibanum, potato, potato, same thing. Um, the ones that I particularly like are the two variety. like there's different ones. Robert Tett, or Robert Tay, Robert Tett, uh, makes a good base. It's a co-distillation of cedarwood and frankincense. Uh, it's called Bois de Incense. And this is a really, really neat material because you get that pencil shaving snappiness that you would get from a cedarwood. But you also get that slight dusty, smoky ashiness from the Oli Bottom. And the co-distillation of the two, it just works really great. I love using the Boise Day Incense from Robert Tett. I use it a lot, actually. It's not my go-to one, though. I've got my go-to one, and it's, it's somewhere out here, I believe. I'll pretend it's this one. But my other go-to one is the Ferminich, their CO2 extract of frankincense, the SFE version. And it's the cleanest smelling. There's no, it's not dark at all. It's not like dank, dark church, you know, cellar dwelling. It's, it's just clean, perfected incense or olibanum, frankincense. It's that just, it's perfect. And usually when you're reaching for an olibanum or a frankincense type material for that kind of vibe, you don't want to impart too much dark, dank, you know, nastiness. And you want the smoky, ashy kind of incense vibe, but you want it to be clean and uplifting and nice. And that's what the Ferminich SFE version does. That's my first and foremost going, that's my first reach. I'll always grab, grab the Ferminich SFE uh, 
frankincense. Now this next one is interesting because this is the complete opposite. This is if you want that dark, musty, dank, like you're in the church cellar of a cathedral kind of incense. And this is Olibanum Vulcane um, or Vulcan. I think there's no I, so it's just Vulcan. And this is not to be messed with. It's just as strong as, you know, all your other frankincense. But this just has that darkness that just, it's like if you were to play good cop, bad cop, this is bad cop. The frankincense SFECO2 extract, that's good cop. Vulcan is bad cop. It'll just kick your ass in a nice way though because it's so dark and musty and dank and, and just smoky it's it just feels like you went into a church and instead of sitting there you know into the main church uh area way you're like i want to go down that doorway into the cellar and see what's hiding in the church's cellar and that's what olibanum vulcan reminds me of it's dark it's mystical it's dank it's scary <laughs> but it's nice i like it so that's it for olibanum and frankincense. Now, when it comes to leathers and suede, um, there's so many different ways you can kind of go into a leather or suede kind of feel. Uh, let's see. Let's do this one. This one. And... This one, maybe this one. Okay, I won't talk about too much because I don't usually do a lot of leather and suede fragrances. Um, sometimes if I do want to leather something up, I'll reach for something like this just to sprinkle it in there just a little bit. Uh, the most common used one that I'm always reaching for, it's kind of like my dumb reach, the one that just seems to work with everything is this material from IFF called Suederol. Now the nice thing about Suederol is, well, yes, it is a leather-like material, but it's a very clean material. It's not dirty. Um, it's not your Russian leather kind of like floral, you know, leather jacket kind of thing. This is a more cleaned up leather material, hence why they called it suede all, because it almost has a suede material. Because if you ever notice how suede just has that real kind of velvety soft kind of padding top to it, this gives off that vibe. It's not a slick, shiny leather. This is that soft, velvety suede kind of like leather. And so suede all from IFF is usually my first number one go-to. If I just need to toss in just a little bit of, you know, leather, leather-esque kind of feel to the fragrance without it becoming a leather smelling boot. Suede all is my usual first go-to. Now if I wanted to actually go towards a actual down the avenue of like okay we're gonna leather this mother effer up. We're gonna really make this leather thing you know shine. Now there's different things I would do. So Cinerome makes a, uh, a, a base. It's a synthetic base called Cure HF by Cinerome. And to me, it's a good uh, leather base. It smells typically of almost like a leather boot that has been polished. Because if you ever have like an old leather jacket, I mean, there's different kinds of leathers out there, but the ones right after you polished and shined them up have like this kind of just this weird not to say alcoholic scent but a freshly polished leather just has a sparkle to it and that's what Cinerome's Cure HF base does it's a clean leather it's not a clean suede like suede all is but it's a definite clean polished leather uh Cure HF from Cinerome that's my go-to leather for that now, if I want, I'm going to put this one back because I never really reach for it. But if you're curious to what it was, it's called Apo uh, Pachon Cure. I think it's from IFF and it's a leather material, but it's a leather mixed in with florals like uh, lilac and, you know, spring flower. So it's just real weird. I never reach for it. I won't talk about it. 
So back to the other leather. If I wanted to kick up the the Cinerome's Cure HF base with some more leather, some manliness, let's you know give it a swift kick in the ass. What can we do to add to it? Um, usually, I have any kind of saffron material, either saffronol um, or saffron. Uh, usually does that. So I particularly like saffronol because it's it's another it's while it is a saffron like material it is a animalic leather saffron like material and a little bit of that super super strong don't let this stuff fool you you smell it from the bottle you're like oh it's not that strong one drop whole blend is just a leather boot um, I keep mine diluted down to 0.1%, and I probably should even delete it further, <laughs> to be honest. Saffronol, I forget who makes it. It's either IFF, maybe Givaudan, but Saffronol is another good leather-esque kind of material that I reach for sometimes. Uh, and there was one more. Oh, so a lot of people, because of the stupid Creed Aventus craze, Everyone's like, what's that leathery note in Creed Aventus? I want to mimic it, blah, blah, blah. And of course, it's uh, IBQ. Um, what is it? Iso uh, Buttle Quinlone or something like that. It's like the acronym is just IBQ. Or you can just get the IFF version, which is Pyrolone. Uh, Pyrolone's the same as IBQ. And I don't reach for it that often because it's so freaking strong. Uh, again, another material I keep uh, diluted down to 0.1%, but it does smell nice. It's kind of like saffronol, but in a more dirtier, smokier kind of leather way. It's kind of like a smoky leather. Like if, saff like if you've got suederol, which is your clean soft pelt suede, You've got your Cinerome's Cure HF, which is like a nice polished leather. You can kick it up a notch with, you know, some saffronol to give it a little edge. Uh, the Pyrolone is kind of like the smokier leather. It's almost like if you want to give it a little smoky edge, kind of like that leather that's been sitting around, smoked in, you know, so, you know for a long, many years. Pyrolone or the uh, IBQ, iso, I think it's iso buttle quinoline. I could be wrong. I always just call it IBQ. Or just get Pyrolone. Same shit. Oop, swore. Same thing. Uh, so that's it for leathers. Uh, so we talked about in, incense, the frankincense, some of the leathers. Uh, some, okay, so smoky things. The only two smoky materials that I ever reach for um, if you want to just add a, a little bit of smoke, um, usually birch tar. Birch tar is everyone's go-to and for good reason. It just works. But with birch tar, you have to really, really dilute the crap out of this for it to be effective. Like, I have this birch tar diluted down to 0.1%. And I probably should dilute it down to 0 0.01 because when I'm smelling it from this bottle, it's still pretty strong for me. It's smoky, but I'm still getting a slightly, I don't want to say rubberiness, but I do detect some of the off notes that come along with birch tar that people don't necessarily like. So, but the more that you dilute it, you still keep the smokiness, but some of the off-putting notes kind of fade to the background a little bit. So if you're going to use birch tar, definitely start at 0.1% as far as a dilution level. I'm going to probably uh, take this down to 0.01 because it's still pretty strong. Uh, let's see. Another good smoky material. Guayacol. Guayacol is the same kind of... Uh, you know, iso molecule that's using like guaiac wood. That's what gives guaiac wood its kind of rubbery smokiness. Guaiacols, it's great. Um, it's not probably as nice and smoky as birch tar, but it has that kind of woody, rubbery, almost resinous feel to it while still being smoky. 
It's one that I don't reach for that often because birch tar just works. But guaiacol is always a second option. And this one I probably won't talk about because I really never reach for it. And it's called Val Spice. It's another smokiness. Uh, it's more of like a campfire smoke, to be honest. It's... Actually, now that I smell that's kind of nice. I might have to start using this. <laughs> I, always reach, I always reach for birch tar for everything smoky. But uh, Val Spice, that's pretty nice. It smells like campfire. Yeah, I might have to revisit that one. Uh, so that's it from the smoky leather and incense bin. Let's go pull out another bin. Okay, so this bin is what I call my ambers and resins. Now the ambers and resins, when I mean ambers, it's not to be confused with the typical woody ambers like your nerlimbanols or ambrosinides. I have a separate bin just for that, which we'll get into. These are your, your typical amber resins, like your oponax, your benzoin, your labdanum, your you know resinous ambery oriental kind of materials, and maybe even uh, like amber gris I, I keep in here as well. Uh, and then some of the other deep, dark, dirty things like civet, smells like shit, but I keep it in this bin. So what's the most ones that I grab for the most? I can tell you right now which ones I grab for the least. Um, uh, Styrax, I grab hardly ever. I don't know why, it just doesn't tickle my fancy. Uh, Peru, or Balsam from Peru. Uh, I have this one that's uh, super rectified with, from Furminich, and it smells nice, don't get me wrong, but I just don't reach for it. So what do I reach for, you're probably asking. So the only real ones that I really ever, ever, ever reach for. Hmm. Labdanum Absolute, for sure. It's actually, my Labdanum Absolute is somewhere out here because I'm using it in this blend. So I'll just, I'll hold this up and pretend that's it. Uh, Labdanum Absolute, for sure, is probably my most used ambery resin. Uh, it's my go-to. Um, Labdanum Absolute, though, for the most part, is pretty strong. I usually keep it at one part per thousand, maybe two, unless I'm really, really going for a resonance or uh, a resiny kind of vibe. I might take it up to maybe, dare I say, 10 parts per thousand, but I'd really never go that high with the Labdanum Absolute. Uh, but yeah, Labdanum Absolute for sure is my most used ambery resin material. Um, now, what's another good one that I love, love using, which is also out here somewhere, and I wish I could find it. Maybe it's in this row. Ah, there it is. I'm glad it's within reach. Ambrane. Now, not to be confused with ambranine, ambrane is a... I, I believe it's a secondary distillation of Labdanum Absolute where it's more refined, uh, a little bit more cleaned up. And to me, the Ambrane smells identical to Labdanum Absolute, but like I said, it's a little bit more cleaner, a little bit more sweeter. Almost has that sweeter kind of benzoin kind of vibe going, but not nearly as sweet as benzoin. But just imagine a very clean and refined Labdanum Absolute. That's Ambrane, and I love Ambrane so much. I picked this up from Perfumer Supply House. Um, actually, I had another bottle of it right here. I should have just grabbed that. Now, a synthetic uh, material that I love reaching for is, I, I believe IFF makes this, and it's called Ambranum. Uh, it could be Furminich, it could be Givaudan. I'm pretty sure it's IFF, I could be wrong. <sighs> Ambranum is probably my most favorited material ever. Like, I could just bathe myself in just this single material. It's a, I believe it, it's, a, it's a base mixture though. And Ambranum is basically two materials. 
it's a labdanum absolute co distilled with olivanum so you get that uh, resiny labdanum smell but that churchy incensey frankincense with it and my god and it's a clean ah oh, it's so it's just clean and just perfect for oriental style fragrances Ambranum, Ambranum, Ambranum. I can't speak highly about the, like I can't speak highly enough about it. I love it. Uh, let's see. And then of course, you need your benzoin. Benzoin is something I reach for quite a bit. Um, it's cheap and it's effective. I believe this is a benzoin that I had purchased and made myself. Let me see if I still have it in here. I do. Where you can get the benzoin tears, or what they're called, or the benzoin rocks, which is just basically Styrax tonkinesis, AKA benzoin rocks, benzoin tears. And if you weigh it out, I actually have a video uh, with this. I made it maybe a year or two ago where I weighed out like five grams of benzoin tears or rocks and then five grams of ethyl, just standard ethyl alcohol and just let it uh, settle for an hour and then it turns into a 50% dilution of benzoin. Uh, like a benzoin, you know, liquid version, uh, but in 50% ethyl alcohol. And I use it for a lot of things, it's nice. It's sweet and it's ambery. It's not as dark as Labdanum Absolute, but it, and it's much sweeter. And that's something I reach for sometimes if I need that effect. Um, now let's talk about another one that I, I probably don't grab that often, but I'll talk about my favorite civet. Uh, because civet, uh, you can't get natural civet anymore because it's inhumane to cats, poor kitties. The one synthetic that I always reach for, for any of my civet needs, I've got multiple ones from different brands, um, but the one that I always reach for is from Firminich, and it's just called Civet Synth, which is basically their synthetic version of civet. And what's there to say about civet? It smells like shit, <laughs> that's for sure. But it's a nice material that if you dose it in trace amounts, I never use it in anything else other than trace amounts. It just gives a nice subtle warmth, uh, a nice animalic warmth uh, in your fragrance without it actually, I mean, if you use too much, it's gonna come across as, you know, shitty basically. But if you use it in trace amounts, it's a nice animalic warmth in your fragrances. And like this bottle, I keep it at, uh, 0.1% is how I have this one diluted. Um, and then my next favorite material. See, I don't have real ambergris. And usually a lot of people use um, things like Cetalox or Ambroxan for ambergris. And to me, that's in a separate bin, which we'll discuss later. Uh, to me, that doesn't smell anything like ambergris. Um, now, I don't own real ambergris because it's so freaking expensive and I don't feel like, you know, dishing out hundreds of dollars just to get two grams of like a tincture of, you know, something like that. So I always reach for the synthetics and my three most used synthetics for ambergris is the one that I use probably the, what I call the dumb reach. The one that I like to usually go for is made from IFF. It's just their standard ambergris olefac. And rumor has it though, this has been discontinued, but you can still pick it up. I think uh, Perfumer's Apprentice still stocks a little bit. You might find some at Perfumer Supply House. Vi uh, Vigon might still have a kilo here or there of this. And I have a, a good sized bottle of this that'll last me probably quite a long time because I, it's something that's really strong and uh, you don't use a lot of uh, ambergris materials because it's so pungent and so strong. But my go-to for anything ambergris related is IFF's Ambergris Olefac. Now, if I want to feature 
an ambergris note, like a prominent, you know, summertime sea sh seashore, seaside ambergris note. Like I want to list this as a featured note in my perfume. I will piggyback IFF's ambergris olefact with these two materials, uh, Ambernol 95, which I believe is also IFF. Ambernol is the natural occurring material in real ambergris. That nasty funk, halitosis, bad breath vibe that you get from real ambergris is Ambernol. So Ambernol 95 from IFF is the, you know, the isomolecule of that. So I'll use, I'll use this with Ambergris Olefact to give it a little bit of life and realism. Uh, I have this heavily diluted down to 0.1% because it's strong and it doesn't smell pleasant on its own. So you just use it in small amounts. And then this one for me, uh, I believe this is Givaudan and it's called Amber Max. Now technically Amber Max should be in the bin with all my other amber woody materials like neurolimbanols, my amber extremes, my ambrosinides, my ambroxins. But to me, Amber Max from Givaudan is different for some reason. When I smell this, comparing it to all the other ones, this smells sweeter. Where the other woody ambers are very dry woody, very piercing and sharp, this has a sweetness to it which kind of steers it more into the direction of ambergris. While it still is a dry woody material, it's still a, you know, amber woody, and it's still really strong. Like I have it diluted to 1% to use, and I would only use it in like maybe one part per thousand max. Um, I keep it in my, my resin, amber and resin bin with my ambergris materials because I like using this alongside with Ambernol 95 and Ambergris Olefac from IFF. Okay, so that is it from the Amber and Resins bin. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more bins to go. Maybe we can knock out one or two more in this video. Let's see, on to the next bin. Okay. This is definitely the last bin for this video, the part two video. I'll have to do a part three video and do the other remaining seven bins that we haven't covered yet. Uh, but this bin is what I call my ozone slash aquatic materials. I've got a few of them already laid out here, so this bin's not full. I got my little, little tag, it says ozone aquatic. So, what are some of my go-to ozone aquatics? Now, me personally, I am a aquatic freak. Like I love summer scents. I love oceanic, watery kind of scents. So I have so many different ones. What's the one that I go to the most? Obviously, Calone. Duh, it's the dumb reach. It's worked so many countless times in every fine fragrance that's been a major hit in the past 10 to 15 years, 20 years maybe. Calone just works. And I, I think Calone is nothing more than just watermelon ketone. It's just a really, really strong watermelon, transparent, effervescent vibe that just, just reminds you of water. Cause it's just, it's like when you bite into a watermelon, what happened? Boom, you're just, your mouth is gushing with just water and it's dripping down your neck. <laughs> that's what Calone is. I like it. Calone is my first go-to dumb reach that just works for anything uh, aquatic or ozonic. Uh, another one that I've been really enjoying recently is Cascalone, uh, which I think is IFF makes Cascalone and Calone. Maybe I could be wrong. Whoever makes Calone also makes Cascalone. And Cascalone is the updated version of Calone. Uh, just came out of a recently captive state uh, less than a year ago. And to me, Cascalone is less melony than Calone but just as still clean and effervescent and watery smelling. It's just not as melony. 
um, it's a good one that I like to reach for quite a bit. Uh, what's another one? Ooh, let's talk about this one. I forget who makes it, but it's called Sentinel. Sentinel is my dumb reach when I want seashore vibes. Like if you want, hold on, let's, let me smell it because it smells good. Yeah. So if you take Calone, pulled out some of that melony vibe, sprinkle in a tinge of maybe seaweed briny and saltiness, not a lot, just a little. That is what Sentinel is. So if you want clean aquatic, cast Calone and Calone is the dumb reach. If you want sea breezy, slightly oceanic, like you've got some seaweed sticking out your toes from walking on the beach, Sentinel does that real good. Uh, what's another one? Now, another one, if I wanted to go and take the Sentinel and amp it up a bit and be like, you know what, Sentinel, I want more of a seaweed vibe. I want more ocean. I want more skanky, you know, I want seagulls pooping on my face as I walk down the beach. Um, I believe Cinerome makes this. It's called Algonone or Algonon, Al probably Algonone. And basically, it's the same scent as, you know, like Sentinel and Calone, but there's no watermelon-ness. Very clean, watery, but instead of a seaweed and brininess that you get from Sentinel, this almost has like a damp algae. Like if you ever seen, or if you ever tried to clean out a pool, like an in-ground pool or, you know, even an outdoor pool, you drain the water and you're left with all that green algae crap along the floor and the walls, you gotta scrub it before you refill it with fresh water. That algae, that dank dampness is algonone in a bottle. But it's a clean, watery version of it. So Sentinel in combination with algonone, oof, you want ocean vibes, you get it right there. What else, what else can we talk about? And another one that I reach for, not quite as often as I should, but I really love using it, and that's a doxel. Now a doxel smells different to many different people. It's actually quite used a lot in men's fragrances than you would think. Like, uh, I believe Blue de Chanel uses a, a touch of a doxel, and I think, uh, Oh, what's the other one? It could be Chroma, maybe not Chromazaro. I'm forgetting. Another big popular one that was in the 90s used a, a Doxel. But a Doxel is basically, it's like Calone without the watermelon vibe. Um, but there's a subtle sweetness to it. It's hard to describe. But the one thing that is off-putting about a Doxel that some people pick up more than others, I don't really pick up much on it to my nose you get an egg white vibe. And to me, if you smell egg whites, I mean, yeah, I guess it can be off-putting, kind of eggy, not like rotten eggs, but just an egg white, like that weird gelatinous egg white sliminess kind of is in a doxel. But it's nice, clean, ozonic, slightly sweet, maybe a touch of egginess in there but some people might not pick up on it. I don't necessarily get it. Not so much. Some people do, I don't. Um, and then, I mean, there's so many other ones that, that I do not necessarily reach for that much. Like as, as your real, I don't reach for that much. Aquamate, I don't reach for that much. Fluoranil, maybe sometimes I'll toy with it, but I, I, I never end up keeping it in the final formula. Ultrazer is one that I, I don't know why, but I love the smell of Ultrazer. But I have such a hard time getting it to work in a formula because it is so, it's a very, it's probably the cleanest ozone aquatic material that I have. It's so sharp and it's almost citrusy sharp. It's, it's almost like it's, it feels like when the sun is beating down on the hot beachy sand and you're stepping on the sand and it's so hot that it burns your feet 
and it's like this bright radiantness because the sun is just so bright and it's just crisp and bright and radiant and it's just ultras are just smells like that to me it's just it's overpower poweringly bright and sharp and zesty for such a uh, uh, ozone and an aquatic material i have a hard time trying to you know keep this in a formula because i try it and then it's just like eh, it doesn't work and i just fall back to my you know my good go-to's not to say that i don't like it i think it's something worth exploring it's just maybe i need to you know dose it lower i have it down to uh 0.1 in dilution maybe i need to use less we'll we'll see on another day and then of course there's other things like melifluor melanol that i don't reach for that often but still useful but i won't talk about it because i don't reach for it and this video is about what are my favorites so i already talked about my favorites so that is it from the oh actually the one uh where is it it's not in the bin because it's sitting out here where are you? Oh, I found my Alimi SFE that I wanted to talk about, but that'll be in another video. Um, where are you? Well, I, I know it's out here somewhere and it's usually in this bin and it's the one that I'm always using in almost, not all my blends, but a lot of them, more than 50%. Helianol. I think it's made by IFF. Helianol is to me like the hedione of ozone aquatic materials. Like most of your ozone aquatic materials are super powerhouse materials that you use at like one part per thousand. You use sparingly in trace amounts and they give huge effects. Helianol is the opposite where you can use in a good amount. Like you can go 1%, 2% in your perfumes finished formula and it gives a nice aquatic kind of wet effervescent feel without being overpowering and helianol is definitely one everyone should definitely have that in their stash of bins uh, stash of goods so that's it from the ozone and aquatic bin um, I think that should wrap it up for this video. It's been one hour and I'll probably have to do a part three and cover the other seven bins that we haven't gone over, which are the woody ambers, all my different citruses, my aldehydes, my sweet and gourmand, my spicy material. There's just all these different things that we haven't covered that are my favorite materials. So we'll end it on that note. And until the next video, see you next time.